good, though, when your kids begin to imitate and reflect the investment that has been made in their life, and you get to watch and see them do things on their own. It's not coerced or appointed or routine. It's just out of their heart, right? It's the, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, or the, the praise comes, right? So um, excited for today. Um, we were here yesterday for quite some time getting things set. Um, I, was, I was out of my element this week as Tammy's been gone since Friday. She was gone through the week helping an aunt in Platteville move out of a home that they had owned for 27 years. And uh, they had to say goodbye to their home. It was a tough time, but she went to minister and helped them physically. And uh, so I've been kind of batching it all week. Me and the wet dogs. <laughs> yeah, that's no fun, you know. Seeing how I, that's, you know, I'm not a big dog. I am, I am a dog fan, but I'm not a wet dog fan, you know. So big difference. Um, I'm going to share a message that I shared here probably three years ago and it just came up in my heart again as the church of Jesus Christ and the recognition of some of just the things that God's called us to that lines up with who he is and you know we 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 hear people in the media and we hear people in the world ever since I was old enough you know I remember back when um, well probably every president does this but I remember George W. Bush, when he came in to his presidency, he was talking about how he was going to cross the aisle and he was going to remove bipartisanship and he was going to be a, a connector and a uniter of both parties. And, and I don't think that happened. I think that was intentional. That were, The intent was there. Um, but you, you also go through and you see other places and times where the world is trying very hard to get unity and, and the uh, togetherness, you know, that comes with being a part of living in the same world, partaking of the same air, right? And being, you know, on the planet together, we got to get along. And there's a difference between getting along and you being united. And today the message is, is very simple. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, but I got a news bulletin for us. Go ahead and put the slide up. Jesus is a divider, not a uniter. Now, you know, you're going to have to give me some space here to unpack this because some of you may be going, what, what is he talking about? But in, in essence, Jesus did say in his, one of the first Gospels that were recorded in Luke 12, actually. He said, do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. So what you need to listen for today when we're doing this message is you need to listen for words that talk about the world and the earth and all, all peoples versus Christian, because there's a distinction. Now, we understand that division means disunion. Jesus came to break, divide, separate us from the world. And what he's been doing all along is trying to prevent us from falling back into the world, right? Right? And if you read the Old Testament, and if you're in the chronological Bible reading, you know, we're in, it's just nasty stuff. Oh my goodness. Kings, kings, bad kings, they do all kinds of bad stuff, and then they get killed, and they get the next guy comes along, he takes over. It's just, but what you notice is God's always saying, he's always working to get the people back into right position, into a unity with him. He's always working for his people to get back on the right track, run home, right? Um, but the problem is the world around us keeps talking about, you know, 
everybody getting along and everybody loving everybody, which is true to an extent. How many of you remember the song? Remember this one? I don't know how, how old. Next slide. Yeah. This is man's idea. I'd like to buy the world a home. Finish it with love. I don't know how it goes. Grow an apple tree and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. Right? I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. There it is. I'd like to buy the world a Coke and keep it company. See? So you got to be careful. So what am I doing today? I'm helping us just keep our balance. Have you ever used a level recently? and you make sure that the bubble is in the middle. Or you might sleep on your head, you know, I don't know, if you're in a camper. That was always a challenge for me. That was the part of camping I didn't like. And I still, you know, that's why you buy a tent, right? I don't know, maybe. But the fact is that the message that the world wants to give us is that if we buy everybody a Coke and a Milky Way bar and we love everybody, We'll live happily ever after, and I've got oceanfront land in South Dakota I can sell you at a real good price. See, the fact is that in John 7, verse 43, this isn't on your slides, the scripture says, so there was a division among the people because of him, him being Jesus. John 9, 16 says, and there was division among them even the disciples. And then John 10, 13, or excuse me, 19 says, therefore, there was a division among, again, among the Jews because of his sayings. In Acts 14, 4, it says, the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews, and part sided with the apostles. Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would be a stumbling or a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Do you have a slide for John 14? Yeah. Wait a minute, Pastor. Didn't you say, didn't Jesus say, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you? What is the deal? He can't, you can't have it both ways. Doesn't Isaiah say, you know, of his coming, that his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace? Don't we want peace? You watch the Miss America thing? I want everybody to be happy, you know. <laughs> Whatever. Of the increase of his government and peace, Pastor, it says there will be no end. So what, what's the deal? The deal is, he's not talking about peace for the world outside of a relationship with him. He's always going to be able, he's always, Jesus is always going to be controversial. He is today. You can talk about anything in the workplace, but you start talking about Jesus and the Bible, you're going to get a call from HR. You can't do that here. You can't do that at school. Teachers, you can't do that. Kids can do it at school. Teachers can't, right? But the fact is that the Bible is very clear in, I think it's Matthew 25, 31. I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read this next one first, though. Matthew 25, thir or excuse me, 13 through 24 through 30. And it just the, the general consensus of this passage was that I am gonna separate the sheep from the goats. I mean, tell me, somebody talk to me. Why would you keep, why would you separate sheep from goats? Do they get along? I used to have a professor in Bible school, and he would do this. He would put his hand over the podium, and he would make a fist, and he would do this. And he said, this is called being a goat head. Hard-headed. Stuck in a rut. No, I'm gonna not changing. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm pushing through this. Well, I think it's interesting when we read Matthew 25, 31 through 33, 
that again, in context to Jesus Christ and the church versus Jesus Christ and the world, there's going to be division. There's going to be separation. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Yes. It's not going to be a cross this time. And all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as sheep, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. There it is again. And he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Now, if if any of us are in here wondering, what is he talking about? This is is Jesus' separation of, you you didn't know me. (laughs) You didn't say yes to me. You, you, didn't, you didn't fall, you didn't accept my gift of salvation. But the sheep, they know my, they know my voice. They're my, shep- they're my, they're my sheep. They're my, the, the sheep of my field. And they said yes to me. He's a separator. He's not, he's not a uniner in that regard. He will, never, he will never make anyone say yes to him. But he'll do everything he can to love them, to get them to say yes. So I love this, this con- it's, well, this sounds like a contradiction. You know, you're talking out both sides of your mouth. He's a, he's a lover of people. He came to seek and sake the lost. He wants to leave his peace with us, but yet he's going to remove people? He's going to divide us, segregate us, and remove us from his presence? Yes, he will. John the Baptist told us of Jesus in his ministry that he has a winnowing fan in his hand, a winnowing fan, something like a sickle. And he will thoroughly clean out the threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's separation. So when you read Old Testament, you get a very clear impression that God is adamant that his people not only know the difference between holy and unholy, but that they are separated unto him. So the reason why God divides and the reason why he separates is to make clear distinction, to make a line in the sand to say, I'm his. I've made the decision to follow Christ. And he's done this all through the Bible in different ways in different places. I like in the Ezekiel Uh, Chapter 22, 26 in the message version. I love this message. Again, this is Old Testament, right? But it says, your priest violated my law. Who is the priest in the New Testament under the dispensation of grace? We are. We're called priests. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. Right? And so he says, "Your, your, your priest have violated my law and desecrated my holy things. You cannot tell the difference between sacred and secular. They tell the people there's no difference between right and wrong. They're contemptuous of my holy Sabbaths, profaning me by trying to pull me down to their level. Does this kind of sound like the world today? The world is doing their best to demand that you accept who they are, but they don't want to accept who we are. (laughs) It's interesting right? He said, you can't tell the difference between sacred and holy. There's no difference between right and wrong. And there's a truth that's been emitting from culture for a long time now that says it's right if it's right for me. And I'll do my thing and you do your thing. If it doesn't bother you, then that's good. And the problem is the church has kind of gotten lulled into this pattern where we're just, we just come to church And we just gather together. But I'm telling you this morning, this sermon is really more about what we need to be doing when we leave here today. And hopefully this will resonate with all of us and and we'll kind of get, get the idea. But the fact is that Jesus is very clear about the distinction or the separation that he desires from those who call him Lord. There's a difference between being saved and him being Lord. There's a distinction. There's a separation. There's a pulling away. Do you understand 
there is a term in the, Old in the New Testament for the word church, church universal, everyone who's a part of the church. And it's called the ecclesia. And if you, if you look that word up, the word means separated, taken out of, and separated unto. So the church, while we are still in the world, not to be of the world, right? We understand this. Your kids need to be in the world, not isolated from it, but insulated from it. There's a difference. And while we'll see at the end of the message today, God isn't calling you and I to go find a bunker somewhere and order a bunch of survival kits and wait for his return. He's wanting us to live here with the mindset that there's a division between me and the sinner, me and the unsaved, me and the world, me and the secular mind, in our lives, in our families, and how we live. We have to declare that distinction. I think 2 Corinthians, peace, the peace versus division. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with the wicked, wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? We said the D word in church, oh my. How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? This was the issue with the children of Israel through the entire Old Testament. They could not shake the fact that they wanted something to worship on the earth. God wasn't good enough. For we are the temple of the living God. Just take your finger right now, point it right here, and say, I'm the temple. I'm the temple of God. The living God. He resides here. And as God said, I will live in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. He's drawing a line. And I'm going to say this. There was a time I grew up in a church that we were really strict. We were that clothesline gospel. We, we had to look the part. We had to, you know, sound like we were the holy people of God. But we didn't always live our life behind closed doors that way. We were hypocritical. By the way, I think that's probably much, pretty much everybody. So if you're here and you say, well, the church is nothing but a bunch of hypocrites, welcome home. <laughs> I've got a key for you. You can come in anytime. The reality is that we were so dogmatic about separating from the world that we got stupid with it. We got off balance, out of whack. The bubble wasn't even close to center. It was on the other end of the stick. And we were like, Pfft. nobody wanted to see us coming. Nobody wanted to be a part of who we were. They didn't come into our church accidentally. They just wander in off the street. We didn't know where else to go. No, they stayed away. But Jesus, Jesus is still calling you and me to divide ourselves, separate ourselves, remove ourselves from the unclean. Now, this does not mean, and you'll hear me in a minute, I'll get there. It doesn't mean that we're not going to love people. It just means we've got to stand for truth. We've got to take what Christ said and who he called us to be and be it all the time. All the time, 24-7, 365. A good example of this is in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, Daniel himself, being a captive in a foreign land, was told he was going to eat the king's food and train in the king's palace and become an advisor to the king, and he was, that was his job, and he was going to do that. And in every step of the way, he honored God in a place of captivity. And you could say to, this is the only hell we're going to ever know right here. This is good news. Because after this, it's all flowers and butterflies and, yeah, honeybees and all that stuff, right? 
heaven's going to be good. But right now, we're living in a place that's very difficult to get along with sometimes, very hard to deal with, the changes that are taking place around us. But he's calling us to a place where we have to live this thing out and not back away from it. And Daniel showed us how. He was so committed to Jesus or to God, he was so committed to the cause that he wouldn't even eat the food off the king's table. And in the end, it was honored. They were honored that he didn't do it because he became smarter, wiser, and was brighter countenance, better. It always pays to serve God. But then they came to a place where they had to bow to an idol. We know the story. Kings 3, or excuse me, Daniel 3. They said, you're going to bow down, you're going to worship this image because it's what the king says. And they said, sorry, <laughs> we're not bowing to that. We're going to stand for something else. We're going to stand for him. And even if it gets us thrown in, we're not going to do it. We know the story. Thus, the fourth man in the fire, God showed up in the form of Jesus Christ. He said, walking around in the fire. What's that fourth guy in there? Didn't we throw in three? And he looks like the son of God. How did that guy know that? Do you understand sometimes that you, your light and who you are and who you represent can be so real sometimes to people? You don't always know it or get it right away, but who you are out there really could make a huge impact in someone else's life. I had an experience this past week with a coworker. I'd never been outside the building with him, never gone anywhere, never socialized or been with this man. But I knew that when I met him like six months ago, that I was supposed to invest some things in his life. But you can't do it at work. So we golfed. This week, what did we golf in? The rain. Yeah. Wet shoes, wet socks. Ugh. Offering me to partake of the iced beverages that I don't partake in. And he said, why, why, every time, why? And I said, because I don't. I'm, I, I believe that there's a better way. You know, I like to be sober. I like to be right-minded. I like to honor God. Oh, that got his attention. Kept playing. I didn't say much. I just kept complimenting his horrible game. <laughs> it, was, it was not good. And the bugs were bad, too, Wes. The, the, I've got skeeter bites all over my head. They couldn't get to me because I was wearing long pants and long shirt. But my head is just like a big bump right now. And, and finally, we got done at the end of that time together, and he comes up, and we put our bags away into the truck, and we're standing there talking, and he says to me, hey, sometime when you have time, I'd like to learn more about your second job. Well, I'd never told him about my second job. He didn't know. I didn't know he knew. Well, apparently people talk. Yeah, right? Does that ever happen where you work? Yeah. And I said, you know what? I would love that. I said, just let you know that I, I'd be happy to share. And we get on the road, and he's still be crying a horrible round of golf and the bug bites and all the things. He was, he was a little frustrated. 20 minutes later, I got a text message from him, and he said, thank you for spending time with me. I would like to do this again. You don't have to become like them to impact them. As a matter of fact, I think sometimes that's the lie of the enemy that he pulls over the wool over all of our eyes. They're looking for something different. The world needs to see something else in a believer. Not, not rigid, not, you know, if you don't turn, you're going to burn right? <laughs> that goes over real good. Not. Although it's true, but it's, I'm not going to, it's not, I'm going to unwrap this gift, right? No, I'm kidding. 
R.C. Sproul said this. He said, unity without the gospel is a worthless unity. It is the very unity of hell and the kiss of Judas. <laughs> I'm like, well, say it plain. For us, for believers, despite the mandate that we've been given to be divided from the world, separated from the world, he said, be ye separate and come out from among them, right? Come out from among them. There needs to be a distinction between a born-again Christian who says Jesus is their Lord instead of looking like the world and following that pattern. There's got to be a change. What would happen, uh, just, just hypothetically, the biggest guy in the church, well, could be Ben, or it might be Larry. <laughs> but whichever one you want to pick, put him out on the highway and have him come into contact with a semi-truck. Will there be an impact? Will there be a result? How about this? When you come in contact with the life-changing message of the gospel and the love of Jesus... It should change who we are. It should impact our life and make us something different. He goes on to say, don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and I will be a son and the daughters, excuse me, and I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters. Now, I want to go on to Colossians 4. I think this is where we go. In spite of this conversation that we're having, we're reminding ourselves, Jesus didn't come to patty cake and get everybody to play along. He drew a line in the sand and said, listen to me, Jesus said, it's my way or it's hell's way. It's the alternative way. Well, there's a lot of ways to get to God. There's a lot of different churches and religions and beliefs. Jesus didn't think so. And he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father except he comes through me. By me, in me. Can I just say, we're going to talk about this in the next few weeks, about who you are in Christ. Man, what a powerful message that is. But here it is. This is, this is in spite of the conversation we've had today. Look at this. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. It doesn't sound like, you know, Jesus, Jesus did not come to be a friend to the sinner in that he was willing to live in their slop and stay there. He, be, he called them to a higher place. We got to be around people that aren't like us. We got to be around the world. We have to rub shoulders. If you don't have any of that going on in your life, you need to fix it. It's like this guy that hired in six months ago to, to the vet's home. I never knew him, didn't know. He lives four blocks from my house. Now I know him. I'm getting more involved in his life and I get getting intimate details of his, his life. And God is saying to me, let your conversation be gracious and attractive. The first thing on Monday morning, well, I hope you went to church this weekend. Did you go to church anywhere? Because I never talked about that. But I want him to see the change that Jesus made in my life coming through me and he wants to know the Holy Spirit will draw them, right? Jesus is a divider. He, you, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot ride the fence. If we read the book of Revelations, we know that Jesus said, be cold or warm, or hot rather. Because if you're warm, you're done. I'm spewing you out. Well, pastor, that's just it. I'm just not going to be, <laughs> can't do that. And I like this last verse that we have today. We can still honor God and respect them. It said instead, 1 Peter 3, 5, 15, and 16, you must worship Christ 
as the Lord of your life. You worship him with your life. And if someone asks you about the hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Well, that doesn't let anybody off the hook, does it? Well, I'm not good with words. Tell your story. Just tell them your story. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was hopeless, now I've got hope. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Jesus, he, Jesus came, John 14. He said, my peace I give unto you, my peace I leave with you. But the only way you can have that peace is you got to know him. You got to be in relationship with him. And then the unity is demanded. Unity is a part of that process. It's in step with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then he goes on to say, hmm, <laughs> in this world, you will have trouble. Is anybody here today thought it was a walk in the park? Okay, just checking. But be of good cheer because I have overcome it. If you're unified with me and you're walking my path and you're walking in the way of the light and you haven't, you know, tried to dance you're going to have the same peace and you're going to have the same victory that I have, that I'm providing, that you can walk in all the time. And I'm going to say as a church, this is the quandary we deal with in the world we live. And more so as the days continue. You will have to make a distinction and a hard decision long before you ever get to the job and punch in, before you ever go out in the public. Am I going to let Jesus Christ be visible today through my life, through my actions, through my words? Am I going to draw a line in the sand that says there's a distinction between me and them? And it's not arrogance, and it's not I'm better than, it's I'm just washing the blood. My conscience is clean. My spirit man has been reborn. I'm not the person I used to be. How can I be the same? How can I walk that way? Nor would I want to. Amen? Hallelujah. Father, I thank you today that your word tells us that your word <laughs> is like a sword. It's sharp. Both sides of it. And it pierces down to the heart of the man, the woman. And it judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And Father, today, the only thing I could really say at the end of this message for, for all of us, including myself, is walk ye there in it. <laughs> Live it out. Let God's word continue to shape us. Put us in remembrance let it be the guide, not someone else telling you you're wrong, not someone else telling you you need to cross back over to the other side. Let the voice of the Spirit, let the, the Word of God do it because he's, His Word's a sword. God, I thank you that, that you have gone to such great extent to make me and us, who we are. Extend your life to us. Extend the goodness of God, the spiritual blessings to us. And let, just keep us, keep us aware and mindful, Father, that you did all of this because you want, you want more. You want the kingdom to grow. You want the kingdom of God to flourish. You desire more and more. You said it. 
you're waiting for the precious fruit of the earth to come in. And so, Father, every day that we're here, help us to make sure that there is definitely a line in the sand. There's a difference. And that that difference isn't one that is offsetting or off-putting, but it's the difference that becomes the drawing card, the vacuum of the world to want to know more. And I thank you, Father, that once we said yes to you, the unity of the brethren, the unity of peace, the unity of joy, the things that you provide are so rem remarkable and, and what a blessing that we can walk in unity with you and step with you, partake with you all the way. And so let us, let our hearts be fixed. So I'm just going to ask everybody in here today to stand. So maybe some of you, some of you, you know, you think, well, I, I don't need to hear this. I pretty well draw the line in the sand every day and I'm good. But then there's some of us that may need to really analyze, maybe where have I, where have, where have I compromised? Or when did I not speak up when I should have? And inside you knew I missed a chance. See, I just want us all today before God, not me telling you to, but you doing it, acknowledge to him. Now, I don't know if you can tell him, Lord, I'm doing fine. Try that one on. <laughs> See if it fits. Maybe you are, but maybe you could just say, God, show me. Is there some places that I need to draw that line again? Maybe I need to use a permanent marker. <laughs> There's a difference between me and the old me and them. So I'm just going to ask you where you're at today. As the music's playing, I'm going to pray. But I'm going to ask you to engage this conversation. You talk to God. You address you and where you're at in your journey. So, Father, today, we, I end this message today by reflection and introspection to just acknowledge before you that I know that as a man, as a human, living in this body, I've made mistakes and I've, I've missed opportunities and I've crossed the line and I've vacillated back and forth at times in my own life because it was too hard or the, the persecution that would come, or the out being ostracized or pushed away. But today, the cost you paid for me, the price that you paid for me becoming a masterpiece, I understand the value. But you also put that in me so that I would reflect your glory in the earth. And this line that you're asking me, this division that you're asking me to, to be involved in that I would continue to separate myself unto you. It's our act of worship. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Do not be conformed. Be transformed. Let the life, what God began in us, separate us and remove us to keep that line of distinction plain so that on that day, I have no doubt, Father, that I'll be in the sheep pen on the right side. God, I'm sorry if I've missed the chance to lead someone into your kingdom because of the way I lived, the way I spoke, the way I acted. God, I repent today and I ask you for new opportunities and new, new avenues of inroads to the lives of those close to me. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name.